Quality Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today we are joined by one of Wisconsin's two U.S. Senators, Tammy Baldwin. Won't you please give her a warm welcome? the last time you were in this room was uh, at a debate yes. at the law school. Yes. We have fond members or not so fond members in that experience? Um, fairly fond. Fairly. <laughs> <laughs> I think the outcome of the election probably makes it seem fonder for you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Senator Baldwin, uh, I don't think he's been with us as a guest for the program uh, since then, so we're uh, delighted to have her with us today. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of different things uh, that are happening in Washington and here in Wisconsin for that matter. But I wanted to begin by, by getting your uh, your perspective on, on where we are today in terms of our ability as a nation to address big challenges. You served in Congress for a number of years, now spent some time in the U.S. Senate. Are we up to the job? Are we up to the task of solving the nation's biggest issues? Well, I have to say that um, you see some low points recently. Um, and it's I also have hope. I would not have sought the office of senator from Wisconsin if I didn't believe that we can do better and that I could play a constructive role uh, in, in making things better. I've also seen, uh, you know, if you, if you read the history books, the Congress of the United States at lower points than it's at today, uh, not responding to. Uh, crises of, of epic proportions um, and, and and getting through that and seeing uh, positive times ahead. So, you know, in my first year, I saw a government shutdown, but I also saw a Congress that is incredibly polarized past the first budget that had been passed in several years. You know, it was supposed to be an annual process, and it had eluded the Congress for uh, several years. And uh, a two-year deal was struck um, in December. And uh, I saw the Congress pass the first appropriations bills that have been produced in a while. Um, those required some compromises. Those required the parties um, backing off uh, bright lines and working together. And so those were glimmers of hope, but not enough to satisfy us. So uh, a lot of work needs to be done. I think the other thing I'd add in just in terms of my own uh, perspective on this is that I obviously just made a transition from serving in the House of Representatives to uh, now a year and some months serving in the US Senate a body that in order to pass anything has to have uh, uh, 60 votes, which at this point, uh, given the, component, the composition of the Senate, means that uh, if all the Democrats and two independents stick together, we need at least five Republicans to come over. And so anything we do is less polarized than my experience was in the House of Representatives. And um, I would say that contrast also gives me hope that things can move forward. You just mentioned that the composition of the Senate, as we all know, there are midterm elections this November. You're not running, but obviously you would like to see the Democrats maintain control of the Senate. Do you think they will do that? I think they will. I think it will be a narrower majority, quite likely, uh, given the terrain on which this uh, uh, midterm election is being fought. Now, in the House, of course, all 435 members of the House are up every two years. A third of the Senate is up, and so you start with this map of the states of who doesn't have any races going on, Wisconsin being a, such a state, um, which states uh, do have active races, and, and whether, um, you know, whether it's a Democrat uh, who one in a state, for example, that Obama might have lost, uh, who's defending their seat versus other scenarios. And so if you look at the map, just like 2012, 2014 is a very difficult map for Democrats. But in 2012, uh, against all uh, predictions, 
Uh, Democrats have to pick up seats in the Senate. Uh, I don't think that will happen in the 2014 midterms, but I do think that uh, you know, if I were to guess today, uh, that uh, Democrats would call the school majority. Uh, one of the big issues this fall uh, uh, will be the, the Affordable Care Act the implementation of it. Uh, Republicans tend to make it an issue and say it's uh, uh, been a botched rollout and it's still too long. Uh, Democrats, uh, some have been somewhat, uh, I think, reluctant to embrace it. Um, the president said about a week ago, hey, we don't need to be apologetic about this. We don't need to defend this. He, he said, that Democrats have a good, strong, right case to be made for this uh, program. Do you agree with them? I do, and I agree with all that you said. I mean, anybody who wouldn't concede that there was a logic roll-off would be ignoring the reality that we all experienced in this country. That was deeply disappointing and frustrating and, uh, you know, to me and to all the people uh, who experienced that, especially those who were stuck trying to uh, find their insurance online. Um, and I would also concede the, the point that you raised that there are flaws. This was an extremely complicated undertaking, and I can't imagine that an undertaking that large and that complicated would be uh, perfect from day one. So there's clear, I can see both points, although I don't think those are the points that the Republicans have been arguing over the years. They've been saying, repeal it, defund it, start over again. Um, but I'd also agree with your latter points, uh, uh, echoing the President, that, um, that we absolutely should take stock of what's happened so far since the passage of this act, and in particular in recent months, but you even start before then, the, um, Three million plus young people who are on their parents' insurance it used to be the most uninsured group demographic age-wise uh, in America, and now uh, many, many have that option. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, seniors who have seen the famous prescription drug donut hole shrink and shrink, and of course it's slated to be ultimately eliminated in its entirety. That affects millions of seniors. The insurance reforms, I can't, I, I've never run across a person really who said we should bring those, um, uh, you know, we, we should do away with those insurance reforms. The idea that somebody with a, a pre-existing condition cannot get insurance um, is something that uh, we are all happy to see behind us. And so there are accomplishments even before the rollout was botched of healthcare.gov that we should be proud of, we should embrace, and we should um, uh, uh, make sure that, that people truly understand those. And then we have apparently over 8 million people who have enrolled either through healthcare.gov or one of the state-based marketplaces. Uh, I think that's also very significant. That we still have a little to do to understand where we are in Wisconsin so far because as I understand it, as of this morning, we haven't seen the Wisconsin-specific numbers. But we looked well on our way to achieving the targets that were set up for the state. And uh, that's despite the fact that um, I believe that our governor and state legislature haven't taken us down the strongest path in deciding not to set up a, a state-based exchange and deciding, um, in my mind, uh, you know, just really regretfully not to expand the Medicaid program, thereby displacing about 77,000 Wisconsinites who uh, have uh, access to better care. So uh, there's a lot more that we have to do when we get the data and we get to dig down uh, further. Um, but I think that this, uh, this embraced uh, a belief that I think is so appropriate at this age in a country such as ours, all in, no one out in the healthcare system. And now we need to perfect it. Yeah, real briefly, uh, the president said the debate over repeal is over. Do you, do you agree? Do you think the debate about repeal is over? I think some folks didn't hear him say that. That's the case because you know we keep on seeing uh, these uh, these attempts to repeal it or to delay uh, provisions or to defund it um, to the point where it's, it's just ridiculous. I think there are close to 50 separate actions on that. 
And as you indicated, uh, we have midterm elections that are likely to be fought around this. We still have people who are standing up and saying they're running for office to repeal it. Uh, so I, I, we're obviously going to have to contend with the rhetoric, uh, but I think as long as this president is in office, nothing's going to get you know, past him that would repeal the bill. A couple of uh, quick uh, follow-up questions on that. You said there's still much we need to know about the data. Does it bother you at all that we don't know how many people have actually, for instance, paid the first premium? Uh, toward, you know, they, they enrolled, but have they paid a first premium? Is that stuff that you need to hear right now or do you want to hear in the immediate future? Well, there's all sorts of things we're going to need to hear because, um, you know, for many people who didn't have the opportunity to have health care, perhaps because of a pre existing health condition, um, this may be the first time they have ever enrolled and started a, a process of a monthly premium. And uh, so we are going to have to understand you know, what, what needs to be done to help that happen. I'm particularly concerned about the 77,000 folks who had previously been on Badger Care who are, um, we hope, making the transition to the health, uh, uh, you know, the, the marketplace here. Um, but I think that will be the case for many, and where even a very um, modest premium responsibility is going to be uh, very, very significant to their household budget, their individual budget. And so it's absolutely we're going to need to know that. We're going to need to know how many of those 77,000 have not yet uh, been um, uh, enrolled or, or enrolled themselves, and, and what we do about that. Um, I was, uh, in my uh, first year in the Senate, um, very uh, interested and in, had lots of dialogue with both our governor's office and the, um, the Department of Health and Human Services about how do we track these people who are being displaced and make sure that they're getting the information to assist with enrollment. And, uh, and the, um, the federal government insisted in Wisconsin's waiver uh, related to Medicaid um, that the state take responsibility to closely track and communicate regularly with that population, but we're not satisfied yet that that's happening. Uh, another question. Should we be concerned about the demographics of those who enrolled? The president said we had over 8 million people enrolled, and he said, uh, he said uh, we had about 35% were in the, the sort of this, this demographic that we need for this program to work. So, you know, I look at some of those numbers and it's, it's the 18 to 34 population is probably more like 28%. Um, and originally I think it was 40% in that group. Does that concern you if we don't have the numbers of people in that young, healthy group uh, participating in the plan? Um, it certainly will be a warning sign that we need to continue to do better as the um, enrollment periods in future years uh, open up again. So obviously this was the, the last open enrollment period. And, um, and those are going to, that's why we need access to this information. Um, it also is a little worrisome because Wisconsin is a state that's older demographically. So our numbers trail the national numbers uh, with regard to um, youth enrollment. Although it's creeped up, uh, we just tend to be an older state now. The medical system in this state um, has long understood that and, and, uh, and knows that. But still, I think uh, we, we need to be concerned. Um, now, granted, in terms of those enrollment numbers we were talking about, that doesn't include the number of children of older adults who have enrolled their dependents when they spend up for family insurance. Those are not counted among the, the healthy youth that were sought. And it doesn't also count separately the youth that stay on their parents' health insurance until they're 26. So some of them might be out of that number who have directly enrolled, but are still in the overall health care system. Which is so you're, you're confident uh, that, that five years down the road, ten years down the road, this will have been a good thing uh, for America. I have no question that having more people with health coverage is a step that we needed to take and a step in the right direction. Um, but it's not the end. And uh, when I talk about that, I, I, I guess I would say that uh, having everybody be a part of the system is important 
to grappling with the next big thing we have to deal with, which is um, costs that have been spiraling. Uh, Stay, I don't want to say out of control because they've actually come down a bit in terms of their the rapidity of the increase since the Affordable Care Act was um, passed. But we know it, between Medicare, Medicaid, um, the Affordable Care Act, and the private um, uh, health care system, that if we continue to see uh, medical rates of inflation um, go far beyond uh, inflationary rates elsewhere, uh, that it's unsustainable, and so that's the next thing that we have to uh, tackle in significant ways. Let's talk about immigration reform for a moment. It's something that, that has been discussed since the president first took office. Um, uh, obviously, the Senate feels a, a comprehensive immigration reform package is the way to go, but the House is pretty clear. I mean, I talked to Congressman White about this, and he said, let's do it one step at a time. Uh, we're not going to do it now. Where do we go? If you have the House saying we're not doing that, the Senate saying we want to go this direction, what happens? Well, so far we've seen it impasse clearly. Um, I, I really hope that the, um, the leadership in the House rethinks this. And uh, you know, to this day, there continue to be a number of efforts with um, prominent Republicans uh, weighing in on this issue um, and encouraging their. Um, <coughs> their fellow party members in the House of Representatives to move forward. Now, we can uh, you know, discuss the, uh, the provisions in the Senate bill, but there is a wisdom to working forward with, uh, moving forward with a comprehensive plan. Because what else in regard is the risk that you know, if one group gets everything they want and walks away from any discussion on the remaining provisions? And, I think in the process in the Senate with this uh, quote unquote gang of eight, four Republicans and four Democrats who put together the, the outline for what we ultimately passed with a 68 vote margin last year, uh, is that they, they had a fundamental belief that these things needed to be in one package, that they interrelate and one affects the other, and so you really can't do this piecemeal and do it right and get it done. Do you think we will have any action on this? It is an election year after all. Would you like to see any movement whatsoever on immigration reform? Well, part of it is, um, you know, it, we can talk about the substance of the bill. Obviously, we can also talk about the politics for the Republican Party. And uh, I think that there are some, especially those with a more national focus, uh, I, who say, this is a must for the Republican Party to be relevant in national elections moving forward. Um, when, by contrast, you have uh, House districts, especially those who might be um, represented by Tea Party animated uh, uh, members, who say, it, it makes no difference to my political future. Uh, or perhaps saying even advancing it might be harmful to that person's political future. And that's where you're having this, uh, this group that has, I think, frustrated Speaker Boehner time and time again, who's, who's become an obstacle to the national Republican Party uh, moving forward on the issue. There, there's some speculation that the, the president might use an executive order to address some of the immigration concerns. Think that's a, a possibility? Is that a realistic possibility? Is that something that, as a lawmaker, you would take? Well, he already has taken executive action on one of the provisions contained in the comprehensive bill that passed the Senate, and that um, relates to the Dream Act young, young people. And basically, so for anyone who doesn't know what the Dream Act youngsters are, it um, mostly refer to a group of, of uh, uh, folks who, were, um, who came into the United States as young children um, with relatives or, uh, I, but through no decision of their own. And so they're here. Uh, many have no, no other home country than the United States, have gone through schools, um, and then have a roadblock to potential college or jobs because of not having uh, any documentation. And so separately, the um, 
uh, the Congress has considered what they call the DREAM Act that would provide a path um, for those uh, DREAM Act youth. Um, it has also been part of the larger comprehensive bill that the Senate passed last year. But the President has, um, by executive action, instructed deferral of any deportation proceedings for those young people. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how I haven't I haven't become a scholar in how much the president can do without Congress acting, but I certainly think that where we're talking about discretion, um, that uh, that would be appropriate uh, in this period of time, and I just can't seem to move forward. One thing that we don't hear a lot of talk about right now, uh, and that was uh, very much a part of. Uh, 2010 and 2012 election cycle is uh, the nation's fiscal challenges. And I'm wondering why that is from your perspective. Why don't we have more discussion about our deficits on 17 plus trillion dollars in debt? Why don't we talk more about that? Why don't we have talk about a big grand bargain in the way of addressing some of these challenges? Well, I'd say a, a couple of things about that. First of all, I do hear it raised frequently. I sit on the Senate Budget Committee, I was on the conference committee that, um, you know, helped result in a two-year budget deal uh, that was brokered, you know, in the final phases between our budget chairman, Patty Murray from Washington, and Paul Ryan, um, the House Budget Chairman. And um, I, I think whenever we have uh, budget committee hearings, we regularly hear about uh, the debt and the deficit, but in the broader context when we're bringing in folks like uh, Doug Almendorf, the head of the Congressional Budget Office, and talking about um, the impact. And I think that there's probably a greater awareness um, that some of the uh, measures like sequestration uh, that went into effect for uh, the better part of the year has um, halted uh, economic growth in some areas of our economy and had a, uh, I don't want to say, well, it has had a, a negative impact on job growth, etc. And so people, are, when they're seeing that data uh, and, and kind of looking at the impact of, of certain steps as opposed to others, they're uh, a little bit more cautious about it. I think there's a recognition that there are some very central and basic investments that one needs to make in order to grow. And uh, whether that's uh, investments in our education system, uh, investments in innovation uh, so that we can lead the world in cutting edge uh, ideas and technologies, or uh, our infrastructure. That those are sort of bedrock uh, commitments that we make and that the central responsibility of, of a government to undertake, um, that if we don't make, if we fail to make, uh, it's um, to the detriment of our, our economy. And so I think it's a more complex and nuanced discussion than we were hearing, say, in the 2010 elections, um, because people are seeing the impact uh, of something like sequestration. Uh, I think also uh, there was uh, a lot of folks giving these issues second thought after the government shutdown it was such a, um, a, a, you know, a disaster uh, last October. So political reasons, in many respects, you, you believe, I guess, looking from your point of view, and you're saying that people are looking at the economy's performance, but also the politics of it, and that's not good politics to be comfortable. That's, that's how you see it. I, I, I guess it's hard to, you know, when you're talking about the um, rhetoric of politicians, it's hard to take politics out of it, but I think that there is some understanding that uh, some of the decisions um, that would be implicit in a grand bargain or, or say, uh, passing Paul Ryan's um, budget uh, would have such a chilling effect on our economy that it would be um, you know, devastating. Do you agree that uh, it is an issue, though, that needs, uh, that, that we are going to have to come to grips with at, at, at some point in the, in the not too distant future? Well, I don't think, I think it's something that we need to come to grips with every day, that it, it shouldn't disappear and only come up from time to time. And that's why I, when you had the 
the two parties in this very polarized Congress come together on the two-year budget deal, um, that was not setting it down the road. There were significant um, uh, significant cuts over a 10-year time horizon that will take place, but I think they were viewed as, um, as cuts that can um, be achieved without a stalling uh, economy that's been sort of sputtering back to life after a recession. Uh, Democrats have talked a fair amount in recent months about a certain pocketbook issues, uh, whether they be close to the minimum wage. Are, are you a fan of, of, of the talk about raising it for over 10 million dollars? That's a new support. I do. Um, I think it's high time that we uh, uh, tackle this issue again and also index it to inflation so that it's something that stays current rather than needs to be you know, once every decade or you know every however long uh, big fight big brawl in the Congress of the United States so I really think especially in these very hard times if anybody who um, who works full-time works hard ought to be able to um, put themselves and their families out of poverty. And um, you know, while there's a spectrum of folks who are impacted by this debate, uh, last time our budget committee did have um, uh, Director Elmendorf uh, before the committee, we asked about, is there any other policy change that you can think of that would lift this many Americans out of poverty at such, um, you know, at, uh, you know, without a huge fiscal donut associated with it. No, I, I can't think of any other uh, policy that would have that um, beneficial result. Do you worry uh, that it results in some jobs being eliminated? I, I had this discussion with Congressman Ryan on my TV show, and, and uh, we talked about the fact that there are different groups of economists out there who differ mm -hmm. in, in their assessment of what a type of minimum wage would mean. Mm -hmm. um, he said, as far as he's concerned, he said it's, it's settled economics. He believes that, that um, and he, he claims uh, that uh, you're going to see a loss of jobs. You're going to see less in the way of job creation if you raise the minimum wage. Did the CBO kind of hint at that? And it's like that the, what the CBO did was review, they didn't do their own study, but they reviewed um, outside studies that had been done over a significant period of time and gave the lowest range and the highest range and sort of reported that out. Um, you know, there's certainly some critics of the methodology that they used in, in this meta study uh, report. Um, you know, you try to look for the best information you can as you're making decisions on policy issues like that. I heard um, recently uh, about some studies that have been done in um, adjacent municipalities where municipalities had gone ahead and increased their minimum wage just for their municipality. Um, a recent, uh, I guess a, a community in uh, New Jersey on its border with Pennsylvania. And it was a great sort of control of an experiment of what happens. And, um, and I think that the results, uh, again, very small, very isolated, there are other factors that could be at play, but the suggestion was that it's actually a job creator because so many people have more money in their pocket. And it makes, you know, if you're doing minimum wage, you're probably not going out to eat. You're probably putting off that car repair. You're probably putting off that appliance purchase even though it's limping on its last days. And those and that's what people have seen. You've uh, been a proponent of the extension of uh, long-term unemployment insurance. Uh, what are the prospects of that? It does not seem like that's going anywhere in the house either, does it, at this point? No, it, it, it is. Um, it, it doesn't seem that they're about to put that on the agenda. And I guess my hope is that as members of Congress throughout the country are, are spending this spring recess at home that they are hearing from the folks impacted. Uh, there were five Republicans who voted to uh, uh, 
extend the emergency unemployment benefits in the Senate. And they did so uh, many times from states with very significant um, long-term unemployed populations. Um, at first they hadn't, we, we actually brought this up four times before we finally passed it through the Senate. And prior to that, uh, objections had been raised about um, you know, how this should be paid for, and ultimately a pay for was agreed upon. And uh, so that, that, that argument against it no longer uh, sort of holds any weight in, in the House. But I fear that my House former colleagues just haven't heard What's going on? I mean, the, the statistic is that for every open job in the United States, there are 2.7 job seekers. Mm -hmm. So, no matter how hard you are working to find employment, there's going to be 1.7 people, not the people come in seven surveys, but who, um, even if you match with all the job openings. And that means there's a crisis that has to be dealt with. I, the other thing is that this is such an important um, issue for families and communities. You know, we're just talking about what happens when we have a little bit more discretionary or disposable income in their pocket. Well, if you're long-term unemployed and that unemployment benefit comes to an end, um, you're really trying to figure out if you're going to keep a roof over your head or keep food on the table. And you're talking about an infusion of dollars into communities that go right into the local grocery store, right into the local gas station, right into the local economy, you're paying the utility bills, paying the rent. Uh, it doesn't stick around in that family budget. It goes right into the local economy. And our local economists could use this as much as the people who are suffering because they've been working so hard to find a job and not able to. I was going to say, when I was you speak, and, and, and I've talked to you a number of times over the last year, um, I get the sense that, that you feel that the, the economic recovery is still pretty fragile, that, that we're not, you know, that uh, it's not one of those old SO 2010 issues, that it's still a very big issue today. Is that an accurate view? Uh, absolutely. 2.7 job speakers for every one job open. That's not a rosy picture. And then the reports that we hear about uh, the middle class losing ground, the um, middle class shrinking, uh, those are people with jobs, but those jobs aren't keeping pace with um, what it costs to get ahead. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of Wisconsinites feel like you know, they're working hard, they're playing by the rules, but they're not getting ahead anymore. They just want a fair shot at that American dream. You touched on income and inequality. Is that is something that, that you feel that as a, a nation we are uh, dealing with or are prepared to deal with? No, I think we're at the very beginning of what will be a, a, long, um, a long discussion. And uh, I think a lot of people, despite the fact that this has been a trend that's been worsening for some time in the United States, that a lot of folks are just waking up to. But it is interesting to hear people from um, all across the ideological spectrum say this is an issue, we can see it, and we have to start talking about strategies to deal with it. Now at this point the strategies are still pretty far from, uh, from one another, but um, I, I think that it's something that we're going to hear a lot more about. Uh, you and I were talking before the program began about uh, you know, our middle class used to be the envy of the world, and now uh, reports are that uh, other um, you know, industrialized countries are, um, are have stronger middle classes than we do. Well, what's that about? When did that happen? What were, who was asleep at the, at the job? And so I do think that's well, something we ought to really worry about. I think of the middle class as being the backbone of our democracy and our economy. A couple of uh, quick fire round questions. We had General James Jones, uh, retired General James Jones, here at the law school on Monday. He is mm -hmm. uh, Obama's former national security advisor. And he made a, a case uh, for approval of the Keystone Pipeline XL project. Um, he thinks it's a sound investment in America's energy future. What do you think about Keystone? No, I, I am sad that it's become as politicized as it has. Um, and I have to say I'm too frustrated by 
delays that have allowed, or have, I think, mean, added to the politicization of the issue. Like the one we just had last week. So there's a process, and that process is very important. The process takes into account um, environmental issues, and it takes into account um, safety issues. And I want to focus mostly on the latter right now, because Wisconsin has had two pipeline breaches in um, in recent years, one in Washington County, and I don't remember the other, I think it was in Adams County. About, I might be wrong on that one, but about, I think in, um, in the one north of here, 55,000 um, 55, gallons leaked, and 50,000 in the other instance. These processes matter and have to be done thoroughly. Um, for our safety, and even if the Keystone doesn't run through Wisconsin, I think that that's important. Now, as I said, I, I, I would like to see these processes as thorough as they need to be, um, have some certainty in terms of an end date, and, uh, and so I understand people's frustration of wanting to know the outcome, wanting to know the answer, um, but I do think that, uh, it, that it's detrimental when politicians become involved and say, without the process, we are simply going to decide the outcome of it. Based on what you know about the project today, would you support it or would you vote against it if it were up to you first? Well, if I were voting on it at all, it means that the process has been politicized because this is a process that is wholly an executive branch function. So I think the answer would be, it depends. You know, if, if you're asking um, to bypass the conclusion of this, um, uh, you know, this process, I would probably vote no, because I don't think politicians should be interfering with it. But I have to say, as I did before, it is mightily frustrating that it hasn't come to a conclusion and the administration hasn't yet uh, done this now. They have their set of arguments why it should take longer to do this. At this point, I think people's um, patience is wearing thin. <laughs> well, it sounds like the president probably won't make a decision until after November, so we'll just wait and see. A uh, question about the, the Great Lakes, uh, the Great Lakes uh, Restoration uh, Act. Um, I, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room who have some concerns about the future of the Great Lakes. Um, uh, the kind of species that are living in there, the changes, dramatic changes they're having for the lakes, lake levels, all of that. Uh, are we um, doing enough to address uh, the issues that are facing our great lakes? Um, I don't think we are yet, but I think we're on our way to bringing renewed attention to the Great Lakes. And I, I, I can see some steps that I don't think will be uh, hugely heavy lifts politically that can get us further down that road. So you talked about the Great Lake Restoration um, Initiative which is funded but not authorized. And so I'm part of an effort to try to make sure that, uh, that this becomes a part of our permanent laws, that we um, don't uh, have our attention diverted again. Another um, really important uh, piece of all of this is embedded in um, a bill that the Senate passed last year and the House is likely to take up fairly soon, or actually they have two, but we need to go to a conference committee, and that's the Water Resources Development Act which deals with our, our nation's water infrastructure and some of the court-related concerns. And when I think about that, uh, it, it's my impression that it has been a coastally focused uh, bill for many, many years, meaning Atlantic and Pacific, and not our freshwater coast here in uh, Wisconsin and in the upper Midwest. And that we were able to successfully fight for some new provisions in the Water Resources Development Act that if they survive the conference committee, I think will also bring renewed attention. But we know the, the major threats, of course, relate to invasive species and particularly Asian carp. I've been frustrated with how long the process has taken to get real action. It takes forever to get recommendations for action. That, that's not enough anymore. Uh, the Asian carp aren't reading the recommendations. <laughs> we need to we need to um, to be really uh, uh, much more focused on that. And so I think it's actually a great time to um, 
come into the U.S. Senate um, as a person. Now, you know, my, my house district was landlocked. I didn't represent, you know, the destroys of Lake Michigan or the destroys of um, Lake Superior. But we're a state on two great lakes that are incredible economic and environmental resources. And uh, I see a real opportunity. We have one of the great champions of the Great Lakes, um, Carl Levin, retiring as a senator from the state of Michigan. And, I think it's a great time to step up and and uh, and uh, play a leadership role. I'm going to open it up to questions in about uh, two minutes. We'll take two minutes to deal with an issue that's gotten a little bit of a media uh, uh, hit, I guess. So people have some interest <laughs> in it, um, and it deals with uh, products that are part of our culture. I mean, it deals with beer and brats and cheese and things like that. <laughs> Tell this is a trade agreement that is currently being yeah. talked about. It could have a serious impact on Wisconsin. Tell us about it. I know you've been uh, active with yes, it. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, so people have been focused a little bit on a trade deal that's being negotiated um, called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there is another trade deal that's being negotiated with uh, countries in the European Union. And uh, in recent uh, uh, trade deals, uh, the European Union has begun to strongly assert something called geographic indicators. In other words, a product that hails from a certain region or a certain city or, or area um, that has a name that links it with that area, that they can use that name exclusively. The best example that most people will think about is champagne. So apparently you can only call something champagne that's produced in the champagne region in France and that somewhere else is called sparkling wine or somewhere else is called cava or prosecco. They want to assert this right for cheese, uh, including Parmesan, Asiago, feta cheese. They want to assert this for various types of meat products like bratwurst, kielbasa, black forest ham. You can only make black forest ham in the black forest, apparently. Um, they want to use it for things like Bavaria and beer. Uh, Sprecher is not at all happy about that. And so, uh, this would have impact on trade and exports in the U.S. and even our internal, our domestic cheese and sausage and beer markets. But think about how disproportionately this issue would affect the state of Wisconsin, where we kind of, uh, you know, we, we uh, are so proud of our heritage of producing um, these products. They are a key part of our uh, state's exports. And so we're, we're mounting the fight. Um, uh, I've led bipartisan letters on the, um, on the uh, bratwurst the, the, and the uh, beer issue. I've joined another uh, effort that was um, started by some of my colleagues on the cheese issue. We've been communicating with our agriculture sector, secretary and our uh, U.S. trade representative and said, you know, don't give in on this one. This is way too important to our state and our, our economy. My final question, Brad. University here. Any reaction to the Supreme Court's ruling yesterday on, on uh, essentially upholding Michigan's ban on racial preferences for college admissions? Any response to that? You know, I, I um, hope to get a chance to read the opinions. I've read characterizations of the opinions probably as many have in the, you know, in, in the morning news. Um, and my understanding, uh, again, without getting um, deeply into any of the opinions is that the question that the court was deciding was when do when does the majority get to decide about minority rights and when not because this was uh, this was a law that was produced by on the basis of a Michigan state referendum so the voters went to the polls now you know I've seen um, I, I've been disappointed sometimes when minority rights are left to the popular will and we see uh, either things codified or things put into state constitutions. Um, you know, it's something that is, uh, that uh, doesn't, I mean, it has various results that we've seen, some that we're happy with, some that we aren't. But I would have to really, you know, I, I believe that um, we benefit if our educational experiences are as diverse as they possibly can be. Um, and so uh, I suspect uh, I will be 
sad when I see the, you know, the, the outcomes, but I think the current inquiry was much more about how you decide and what group of people get to decide, decide such issues. So I'll, I'll read it with interest and I'll see if my, uh, my um, guesses about what that decision turned on are correct. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you're down in the seating bowl, uh, please press down on the rim, not on the ball, but on the rim. Keep your finger down on it and we'll all be able to hear your question. If you're in the back, uh, Steve will try and walk around if he has a chance. He's got a microphone away from the microphone so that you can watch this online so that you can hear So Let me start with this gentleman right here. Uh, uh, first of all, I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate your agreement. Yes, uh, Thanks. Uh, agreement. Yeah, speak as loudly as you can. Uh, so you mentioned a lot about the Affordable Care Act, uh, long-term unemployment, minimum wage, and these are all very noble things, but they all have certain negative economic implications, specifically for the Affordable Care Act. In terms of what you obviously said, um, that's projected to be a pretty long-term impact. And my question is, you know, as a member of the Senate Budget Committee, how do you plan on trying to offset these certain costs and Possible negative implications while still trying to keep that. Well, actually, the, the budget numbers about the Affordable Care Act are a great opportunity. Um, it, 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 it's actually what we've been seeing in the 10 year projections are in, in exactly the opposite direction than your question suggests. And it's enormously frustrating because, you know, when we're trying to figure out how to cut, um, you know, a billion here, a billion there, and then you see that the Congressional Budget Office has revised the, um, uh, let's say, for example, the Medicare expenditures over the next 10 years downwards by half a trillion dollars. And you say, well, why did they do that? Oh, well, because some of the impacts that we're seeing early on in the Affordable Care Act suggest that that will be if played out over 10 years as a result. It's like, wait, we don't get to take any credit for that? You just put that into the new baseline? So we, we actually have to look carefully at, at what is happening, and I think that um, uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, um, we are going to see, um, and we're at the early stages of some significant reforms in how we pay for health care, um, that I hope will begin to rein in the um, inflationary uh, uh, trajectory that we've seen in, in past in medical um, inflation. Um, War has to be done. There's no question about that. But um, but I think it's having a very significant uh, positive impact on out your uh, expenditures, and we'll see less debt because of that. If you look at um, CBO baselines going forward compared to those that were produced just a few years ago before the uh, Affordable Care Act was in effect. Yes. Thank you for your comments. Uh, really. Uh, I had a grad that was graduating next week, and uh, we saw Senator Elizabeth Warren on TV last night. And I'm wondering if you're going to join her campaign to lower the student loan rate to, I think she said 3.2%, and she is very upset with the disparity between the loans that are given to our college students and the loans that are given to banks the federal loans, and they are charged no interest. And are you going to be part of that? Well, I can say she and I sit together on the Senate um, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. The nickname for that is Health, <laughs> Health Education, <laughs> Labor, and Pensions. Um, she, she sits right, to, right beside me, and we um, have the uh, task ahead of us of reauthorizing the Higher Education Act. And we've been uh, involved in a series of hearings over the past um, six months preparing for that reauthorization, focusing on the affordability of higher education, the financial aid system, the tuition uh, increases that we're seeing, um, all of which need to be looked at because it's not just each of these in isolation. She's always so great at pointing out that the way we have uh, direct um, federal lending, the way we have it set up, the federal government makes a profit off of the student loans. And the question we should ask ourselves is, do we want 
to do that? Or is this an investment that we feel we should be making um, at a break-even point? Now, I'm not saying there's no overhead that needs to be applied to this, but um, and, and I think a lot of people say we should re-examine that. Now, in order to make that change in, uh, and to actually pass it and get it onto the president's desk, we would have to find a pay for it. Because, you, you know, nothing's passing through, um, through uh, Congress these days that adds to the, the deficit or debt, or at least I should say very rarely um, are we creating new policies that would impact that. But with an eye towards being able to answer that question, I think that um, that reexamination makes complete sense. And uh, I'm not sure that I would use the banks as the, um, as the comparison as much as I would say uh, the federal government shouldn't use this as a revenue source. We should you know, charge what it costs to administer the program and make up for that small percentage of folks who default. But it shouldn't be seen as uh, you know, a tax, uh, a source of revenue for the federal government. And uh, I, I hope that we get a chance to move in that direction. Let me uh, look over this area. Go up here with this young man. Okay. Um, I, uh, I also wanted to ask you about uh, your comments on the uh, trade agreements. Trade I know the Pacific one is pretty close to being a, a done deal in terms of the particular the European Union one is pretty far away. Uh, it's, it seems as if a lot of Senate Democratic leadership uh, really doesn't want to grant fast track authority to the president. The last time they were granted all the past on seven votes. So, uh, locally, I can understand your concerns. Is there any potential compromise that you can see in that? Yeah, well, let, let me sort of take, it, take that in pieces. And I'm not sure how close we are with the Trans Pacific Partnership. As you know, the president um, is uh, actually taking a trip this week, um, and this topic is supposed to be part of his discussions when he visits. Japan and um, South Korea, I think he's going to Malaysia and the Philippines. But, um, I, so I, I'm not sure how far along, and one of the things that's uh, very frustrating, I think, to members of Congress is that so much of these negotiations happen um, out, out of public sight. And you, you don't see contemporaneous documents that are being discussed, and it kind of gets um, you know, sent, sent over as a fait accompli. Um, and, and that takes us to the whole issue you raised of, um, of uh, trade promotion authority. Because um, I understand intellectually the reason why we need to give um, the, the president the negotiating room. Because otherwise, if you didn't, you would not be having a uh, a trade negotiation among one representative or a couple from each country, you'd actually be, you'd be negotiating with every parliamentarian from every country at the table because we have the responsibility for ratifying or dissenting on these agreements. And um, as part of that, we have a, 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 an authority to be able to offer amendments, to be able to ask for changes in things, in bills that come before us, or agreements that come before us. And so the administration has to say, well, you can't possibly negotiate a trade agreement if after the president agrees, there's 100 senators who also get to amend it and 435 House members who also get to amend it. And so they have these trade promotion authority or fast track deals um, to basically ask the Congress to give up its authority to shape these trade deals in advance. Um, now, I think members of Congress should be pretty cautious about doing so, about letting go of our authority to represent you in the details of these things. And that you should only contemplate saying yes to that if you get enough agreements up front that you know you're going to like the trade deal when it comes, or of course you still have the right to vote no. And I just don't think in this particular version of trade promotion authority that we're there yet. And it probably will weigh more heavily on the TPP than the deal with the European Union in the sense that you're dealing with economies at various stages of development. 
And if a manufacturing state like Wisconsin is worried about jobs going to the places where you can hire the lowest wage workers, that's more of a threat than a trade negotiation state with the more, you know, the countries that have more developed economies and minimum wages and worker protections, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, but I, I also think that you're probably accurate about uh, what the timing of such a deal, uh, there has been caution expressed by uh, Majority Leader Reid about um, when this might come up. And it may be one of those other things that just gets funded until after the election uh, in terms of debate. We have time for two quick questions. Let me, uh, let me go back to one of the, the students back there. How about this guy right there? Uh, gray shirt, gray sweater. And we'll try and come down here and wrap things up. And if you can keep your question brief, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, my question goes along the vein of the student loan question before. Uh, whether there are any changes that you foresee coming down the pipeline of student loan forgiveness for law students that will be working in the public sector. <laughs> <laughs> whether you would support such a change. You know, I, I do think that we are going to have uh, discussion about um, both loan consolidation and renegotiation of loans, uh, as well as forgiveness programs. And uh, I, I've actually heard it brought up um, also in other fields aside from law, so I don't want to, uh, and I think we'll probably have a fairly comprehensive discussion about that. Right now, and, if, and um, just to track on some of our conversations about the Affordable Care Act, that's actually, uh, people ask me all the time what needs fixing in it, and there's a number of things that need fixing in it, but the loan forgiveness um, and provisions in the Affordable Care Act uh, do not appear to be aligned with where we want to promote more, um, you know, more people uh, uh, getting involved. And so, you know, we talk about the Affordable Care Act as hopefully providing a pivot to uh, primary care fields where, uh, uh, and, and less specialization, uh, but we haven't aligned the loan forgiveness programs in a way that will help uh, people make those decisions up front. Um, but I think that we are ripe now for a debate on that, and the Higher Education Act reauthorization certainly provides one forum uh, among several where we can undertake that. And I think, uh, you know, looking at where, um, where we hope uh, people will uh, make decisions to engage in public service is a key element of that. So I hope you are considering public service as part of your career. I was going to wish you good luck. I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this to be the final question. Can okay. you comment on the disparity of wages in this country? It used to be you had a million dollars, you were rich. Now a lot of people make a million dollars in a year. And some corporate executives ask me to make five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars a year. Hedge fund operators can make a billion dollars a year. If you're on a minimum wage, you need food stamps. Something that. And you know, I also earlier was talking about the shrinking of the middle class, which is um, of, of very great significance um, because. I, again, I consider the middle class to be the, the backbone of our, our U.S. economy. We clearly have a system that has chosen uh, in certain policy decisions made to reward wealth over work. And the best tax examples I can give you are the fact that um, the capital gains and uh, the carried interest rule whereby uh, people like Mitt Romney had to confess that he was paying 13.9%, was that, am I remembering that uh, figure correct? That was his um, effective tax rate. Um, whereas the people who are engaged in physical and intellectual labor um, will pay on their income at a much higher rate, depending on where they are on, on that income scale. Um, but it reminds me of the bucket rule. You may remember I used to be the chief house author of the, the bucket rule, 
where Warren Buffett, who is one of such um, uh, people who a lot of his annual income is income derived not from his labor, but from investment of his wealth and what he recoups from that, that he pays at a lower rate than his secretary does. And uh, all of her income is derived from her labors, uh, whether intellectual or, or physical. And uh, I think we have to question a system that looks that way. Uh, in other countries um, that are uh, less capitalist than the United States, um, uh, you have seen proposals to limit how much more a chief executive officer can make compared to the lowest wage of his or her workers. I don't think we're going to be seeing those sort of initiatives. I think they've been referendum type initiatives in other parts of the world. I don't suspect we'll see them here. But that leaves the tax code really as our um, predominant way of looking at this and understanding this. And I think just that statement alone that we regard and value uh, income derived from wealth more than we regard as value income derived from physical or intellectual labor, that's, that's an issue we should think about. I'm going to wrap things up there. Uh, since this is a politically engaged uh, group, I'd like to uh, mention that on March, on May 15th, I should say, May 15th, uh, the law school and the Milwaukee Journal Center will be doing a day-long conference here in this building, in this very room. We'll be looking at the subject of political polarization. The Washington Bureau Chief Craig Gilbert, uh, the newspaper, uh, has been working closely with uh, Professor Charles Franklin at the law school, looking at voting trends in this region over the last 30, 40 years, also voting trends in other parts of the country. Uh, they've come up with some very interesting data, and we will take a look at uh, uh, what is happening here, uh, we'll take a look at the policy implications and the implications for political engagement. It'll be a good day. We have a good uh, cross-section of people uh, participating, and we hope that if you have the time, you can join us again. That's on May 15th, your ex sign Hall. Having said that, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for your attention today, for your interest in this topic, and again, our special thanks to U.S. Senator Tammy Hall. Thank you.